Project Guru. 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 Всем привет! С вами Зак Новак на радиостанции Новорусия Rocks. Welcome to Новорусия Rocks radio station. This is Zach Novak, your American in downtown Donetsk. The program is called Project Guru and Guru is in the house as always. Andre, my engineer, let's get right to it. Egypt Air A320 wreckage has been found near the Greek Karpatos Island. The wreckage of the missing Egyptian plane A320 has been found near the Greek Karpatos Island, the Egypt airline reported on Friday. The Egyptian Ministry of Civil Aviation has just received an official letter from the Foreign Ministry of Egypt saying that debris of the missing plane has been found at the Greek Karpatos Island, the air carrier said, adding that the families of the airline passengers have been informed of that. The Egypt Air A320 plane en route from Paris to Cairo disappeared from radar some 280 kilometers off the Egyptian coast. There were 66 people on board, 56 passengers, including three children and 10 crew members. The list presented by the air carrier include representatives of 12 countries, most of whom were Egyptian and French nationals. There were no Russian citizens on board. The search efforts continued throughout the day. Ships and aircraft of Greece, the UK, France, Cyprus, Italy, and the United States have been providing assistance to the Egyptian armed forces in finding the missing aircraft. All-out war returning to Syria as U.S.-backed terrorists gear up once again. With the ceasefire increasingly crumbling across Syria, the return to all-out war is being embraced by a lot of U.S.-backed terrorist rebel groups, but none more so than Al-Qaeda's loser of front, which was never a party to the truce to begin with and used the ceasefire period to re- re-establish itself as a major rebel force with numerous Islamists allies. While Nusra never lost its stranglehold on Idlib province, they also used the relative calm among other factions as a chance to push back into the area around Aleppo, setting the stage for weeks of bloody, high-profile fighting against the military. With a lot of Islamist rebels not only part of the ceasefire but not really happy with it, Nusra's aggression was embraced by many and those groups are increasingly rallying to the banner of Nusra's umbrella group, the Jaish al fatah Al-Qaeda's parent organization is also increasingly behind the Syrian affiliate with reports that a number of senior Al-Qaeda figures have been deployed to Syria to help Nusra prepare for the establishment of an independent emirate in northern Syria, an effort to challenge another U.S.-backed terrorist group, ISIS, by establishing their own state in the region. Syrian army takes advantage of infighting between terrorist rebel factions capturing several towns. Just two days after a round of infighting between U.S.-backed terrorist rebel factions, the Syrian military is moving aggressively into eastern Ghouta, capturing several towns in the area just southeast of the capital city of Damascus. The fighting earlier in the week between Jais al-Islam and the rival Falak al-Rahman rebel coalition appears to have played a role in today's events, with Jais al-Islam reportedly withdrawing 800 fighters from the towns on the front lines just ahead of the military's push. This forced other rebels in the area to scramble to try to get their own fighters in place around the area, which had been contested between the rebels before, and they were unable to get sufficient numbers into the area in time to hold it from the new offensive. There were no details on the death toll of today's fighting from either side. Hezbollah reported in their own media that they were involved aiding the army against the rebels as they have so often nationwide during the civil war. Nazi Kiev forces attacking once again war crimes, genocide, atrocities, once again attacking civilian areas of Donetsk People's Republic. The Nazi Kiev fighters launched in the, in the early evening 62 mortars at the northern suburb of Donetsk, Yasilovate checkpoint and Dokuchayevsk. The DPR Defense Ministry provided this data last night. Ukrainian fighters, Nazi fighters shelled village Starobihailovka, Spartak, Yasilovata checkpoints and Dokuchayevsk early evening at 5.40 p.m. to 8.30. Altogether, 50 mortars of 82, 82 caliber and 12 of the 120 120 calibers were launched on civilian areas with more information coming in anti-tank rocket systems grenade launchers and small arms were used the shelling carried out from ukrainian uh, nazi positions adievka novotroitskoye 
and Krasnogorovka. Earlier, it was reported that three homes were destroyed in the Spartak area of Donetsk. Thank goodness there were no casualties. Terrorist organization NATO pushing for war with Russia. The ink isn't even dry on the latest moves by the alliance's foreign ministers to finalize the current anti-Russia military buildup, the largest since the Cold War ended, and officials are already openly talking about doing more to target Russia along their frontier. NATO Fascist Secretary General James Stoltenberg told reporters today that discussions are ongoing on how terrorist NATO can project stability around its borders, language which in the last few years has always boiled down to putting more troops on the Russian borders and issuing more statements predicting an imminent Russian attack on Europe. U.S. Ambassador Douglas Lutz said the plan is for a very sober discussion on dealing with Russia, insisting Russia has thrown out the rule book and NATO has to respond. Lutz is seen as loudly advocating for more military buildups around Europe to target Russia. And while there was some talk among European members about targeting ISIS in Libya at the ongoing NATO meetings, materially everything that was agreed to, including future talks in Warsaw, were about targeting Russia more aggressively. Even the decision to invite tiny Montenegro to the alliance was seen primarily as being about thumbing their nose at Russia for criticizing the continued expansion of NATO deeper into Warsaw Pact territory. Russia hopes that the deliberate targeting of journalists by the Kiev junta will be investigated. Russia hopes the shelling of journalists in Donbass will get a proper assessment by relevant international institutions, including the Office of Representative of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, that's the OSCE, on freedom of the media, Dunya Miatovich. Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zaharova said Thursday, I can say that we have established a good contact with OSCE representative on freedom of the media, Dunya Miatovich. She really does very much to protect the rights of journalists across the world, and you Ukraine for her is one of the focal points. We hope a relevant assessment will be given. Zaharova suggested establishing an institution that would finally make it possible to solve problems in the sphere of freedom of speech in Ukraine. It's necessary to go over the specific actions. Certainly, Ukraine is an independent state that conducts an independent, partially independent policy, but we are perfectly aware that the topic of Ukraine is on the agenda of entire Europe, and not only Europe, but also the United States and other countries. So it's necessary to do everything possible to create an institution protecting, protecting the journalists in Ukraine. She added that the talk is about introducing clear rules of accreditation for all media employees without exception so that journalists are not divided by principle of ethnic origin and political loyalty so that they have access to facilities that interest them. For the Ukrainian authorities to finally start implementing the commitments in the sphere of journalists, security taken within the framework of international organizations. I'm perfectly aware why, in particular, the faith of Russians, Russian journalists, is ignored. They don't like what they write and say, but it seems to me it's necessary to realize that they do not show something invented, but what really exists. It's in the interest of Kiev to understand what is going on on the problematic borders and overcome these problems instead of putting them under the carpet and pretending that there's nothing. On May 18th, an NTV television channel camera crew came under fire from direction of Ukraine positions in the area of the Gorlovka Yasinovata Highway. A few days earlier, all Russian state television and radio broadcast company journalists came under fire in the same place. Fascist Turkish Armed Forces confirm military helicopter was shot down by PKK. Viva PKK! Fascist Turkish Armed Forces said on Thursday that a military helicopter that crashed a week ago during clashes that killed eight soldiers, including two pilots, may have been brought down by the Kurdish militants with a ground-to-air missile. If confirmed, it would be the first known usage in recent years of such weaponry by the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK militants, who have been waging an insurgency for Kurdish autonomy in Turkey's southeast for more than three decades. The Armed Forces initially said the helicopter had crashed last Friday due to a tech 
technical fault during air operations against PKK fighters in the province of Hakkari near the border with Iraq. As the helicopters carried out their mission, the conclusion has been reached that one helicopter may have been struck and downed with an air defense weapon that could have been a missile possibly fired from the ground. Separately, the Army said one Turkish soldier was killed and nine others were wounded on Thursday during Army operations in the southeastern town of Lasuyabin near the Syrian border after Kurdish militants detonated a remotely controlled device. Another soldier was killed in the eastern province of Van and 10 Kurdish militants were killed in clashes with the army across three southeastern towns on Wednesday. The military also said Turkish warplanes killed 15 militants in airstrikes on Wednesday on PKK shelters, caves and gun posts in southeastern town of Smenili in the northern Iraq. After the collapse of the ceasefire last July, Turkey's southeast has seen some of the worst fighting since the height of the Kurdish insurgency in the 90s. President, fascist President Erdogan, who had spearheaded the peace process between the state and the PKK, has ruled out any return to negotiations and has vowed to crush the militant group. Thousands of people, including hundreds of civilians, have been killed in the violence since July. The PKK is considered a terrorist organization by Turkey, the European Union, and the United States. Erdogan's office said in a statement earlier that U.S. President Barack Obama had discussed with the Turkish leader in a phone call late on Wednesday, strengthening cooperation and fighting all terrorist organizations, including the PKK. But let me tell you, folks, the PKK are not the terrorists. They are the freedom fighters. It is you, Turkey, and the United States who are the terrorists. Russia will respond to terrorist organization NATO blackmailing Montenegro. Hey, folks, this is very important. NATO's attempts to change the political landscape in Europe touch upon Russia's interests and prompted to respond, Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zaharova said Thursday. NATO's latest attempts at changing the military and political landscape in Europe, in particular in the context of its outspoken policy of deterrence towards Russia, will inevitably inevitably affect Russia's interests and force it to respond proportionately. According to the diplomat, dragging Montenegro into NATO won't be left without Russia's reaction. As for the just-signed protocol on Montenegro's accession to Washington's treaty, it merely confirms the intention of Brussels to accelerate the admission process to the maximum extent and make it irreversible, Zaharova said. The efforts to artificially drag Podgorica into the alliance are proceeding against the background of backstage deals with Montenegro's top officials in defiance of the opinion, the opinion of the country's people, and in bypass of the democratic principles and procedures NATO is ostensibly firmly committed to. The 28 NATO foreign ministers on Thursday signed a protocol on Montenegro's admission to the alliance in the capacity of an observer. Once the ratification has been completed, Montenegro will become the 29th member of NATO, the terrorist organization NATO. Montenegro is unlikely to support NATO membership in referendum. The head of the Balkan countries group of the Russian Institute of Strategic Studies, Nikita Bandarev, told TASS in an interview that the people of Montenegro Montenegro are unlikely, unlikely to come out in support of the authorities' idea to make the country a member of NATO should the issue be put to a vote in a referendum. He believes there is no reason for panic because for now the alliance admits only observers. According to most optimistic estimates, the question of their admission to NATO as a full-fledged member may approach the final phase no earlier than the end of this year. In reality, this may take place in the middle of 2017, he believes. It goes without saying that Montenegro's admission to the alliance as an observer is the first step towards full membership. Whether Montenegro is a member of NATO or not does not influence anything at all. This is not a pragmatic decision that might have been prompted by some practical benefits for NATO. That's plain politics and a flick on Russia's nose. NATO's presence in the region is quite significant. There are bases in Greece and Italy, and there is a base of the U.S. contingent in Kosovo, Bon Steel. In fact, in fact, it functions as NATO base already, so the prospects of Montenegro and eventually Serbia joining NATO is pure politics, nothing more, Bondanev said. Montenegro's problem is that people do not wish to enter the alliance. The country suffered from NATO bombardments in 99, so the people have no wish to join NATO while its leaders while its leaders do have such an intention. Russia pays so much attention to this affair, not because Montenegro's membership of the alliance might harm us in some way, hinder some 
something or cause certain influences, but because the leadership of a European country is dragging it into NATO against the will, against the will of its people. Montenegro's oppositional parties want a referendum to be called on the issue, while the leadership is emphatically against holding it. In this situation, Moscow would like to see the voice of Montenegro's people heard and the procedure of its admission to the alliance be democratic and transparent and a referendum to be held, Bondanov said. It is pretty clear that a referendum will give NATO not a slightest chance because the people are against it. Hey folks, as I stress always, be safe out there, stay on alert, and let me tell you, we are living in dangerous times. NATO, the aggressors, the terrorists are really pushing for war, so everyone just be alert out there, do what you have to do, get out there, protest, strike, blog it, Facebook it, Twitter it, just everybody be together and stop the madness. Everybody out there, have a great weekend and see you all on Monday. Bye-bye, folks.